as if this top secret document doesn't exist. As if the Zionist government didn't try to halt all publications of this diary. But Zionist propaganda is so demented, so stark raving mad, its defense today is the same delirious propaganda after the October 7th attacks, when the first headlines came flooding. Surprise attack, caught by surprise. Right to defend itself, must defend itself. But these pages all told, cast their propaganda to the wind. Let's turn back several decades to when a certain top secret classified document was circulating the highest rungs of the US government. This document, now declassified, was proposed and submitted by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and in it, they map, they outline how they will orchestrate terrorism, how they will orchestrate carnage, just like a play in a theater, and blame it on a rival country in order to win public outcry, in order to win public favor for a war against any foreign target they so choose. This was called Operation North Woods, drafted 1962. This memorandum was composed for the sole purpose of manufacturing, quote, pretexts which would provide justification for U.S. military intervention. How can we invade? How can we destroy a country that's done nothing to us, that poses no threat? We have to fake reasons. We have to fake dangers and fake threats. Pretexts which would provide justification. And an obvious question is, Justification to who? Why to you? To the public? The world? They don't care about what you think so long as you're not thinking about them. But to appear saintly, to be hailed and adored as heroes just after they've convinced you of their victimhood, this illusory image must always be maintained if not enforced. As they have written, place the United States in the position of suffering justifiable grievances. World opinion and the United Nations Forum should be favorably affected by developing the international image of the Cuban government as rash and irresponsible, as an alarming and unpredictable threat to the peace of the Western Hemisphere. The Chief of Defense requested from the Joint Chiefs of Staff ideas for pretext, ideas on how to frame other countries that make it seem as if they attack the U.S. so that the U.S can invade and annihilate that country under the guise of defending itself and under the guise of defending freedom. But for the task of brainstorming ideas, they approach Army General L. L. Lemnetzer, Lyman Lewis Lemnetzer from Pennsylvania, and he's just the man for the job. In Operation Northwood, he writes, since it would seem desirable to use legitimate provocation as the basis of U.S. military intervention in Cuba, a cover and deception plan could be executed as an initial effort to provoke Cuban reactions, harassment, plus deceptive actions to convince the Cubans of an imminent invasion would be emphasized. A series of well-coordinated incidents will be planned to place in and around Guantanamo to give the genuine appearance of being done by hostile Cuban forces. Notice, this is twofold. In the first instance, he speaks of using deception plans to provoke Cuba to attack the US. But in the second, the US itself stages attacks within the US and then put the blame on Cuba. A single isolated staged incident a series of well-coordinated incidents. And listen to this man's words. Give the genuine appearance. Here's a four-star decorated veteran army general, and he doesn't know he's speaking in paradoxical terms. Something cannot be genuine if it is fake to appear so. But his statement is clear. The reality, as the public sees it, will be what we say. And to that end, we must deploy well-coordinated Deception plans, harassment, and deceptive actions. Lemnetzer begins his recommendations. Point A, incidents to establish a credible attack. One, start rumors, many. Use clandestine radio. Clandestine radio is short frequency stations that pose as legitimate radio broadcasters, but are actually foreign owned 
and intended to provoke Cuba to attack the U.S. Three, capture Cuban, friendly Cubans, saboteurs inside the base. Start riots near the base main gate. Friendly Cubans. Well, these are their agents. The third recommendation. I remember the main incident could be arranged in several forms. We could blow up a U.S. ship in Guantanamo Bay and blame Cuba. This remember the main is referring to the USS Maine, a U.S. naval ship that mysteriously exploded in the harbor of Cuba, killing nearly 300 on board in 1898. The press and the media within the U.S. roused the nation until even the street sweeper was screaming for war against Spain. Remember the main was a cry for war. Remember the main to hell with Spain was the chant and war was declared upon Spain soon thereafter. And now Lemnitza is saying, we can recreate this national hysteria, this bloodthirsty cry of remember the main. This is how much they care for their own veterans. We'll blow up our own ship in Guantanamo Bay and then cry for them on Veterans Day. This next one, notice how shrewd and cunning, how far they're willing to go to instigate wars and death. Lemnitza continues. We could blow up a drone, an unmanned vessel. Notice, they specify unmanned here, because elsewhere in the document, it's part of their plan to slaughter their own. We could blow up a drone, an unmanned vessel, anywhere in Cuban waters. We could arrange to cause such, a, such an accident in the vicinity of Havana or Santiago as a spectacular result of a Cuban attack from air or sea or both. The presence of Cuban planes or ships merely investigating the intent of the vessel could be fairly compelling evidence that the ship was taken under attack. The U.S. could evacuate remaining members of a non-existent crew. Look how nefarious. We'll blow up our own ship in Cuban waters, and then when Cuban ships come out to investigate that vessel of ours, we'll snap photos of them from a distance and make it seem as if these Cuban ships were the ones that destroyed our vessel. And this next one. Casualty lists in the U.S. newspaper would cause a helpful wave of national indignation. A list of dead people. A lost crew who never even existed could cause a helpful wave, hatred, within the heart of the nation and cry for vengeance against Cuba. A helpful wave of national indignation. Death, terrorism, mayhem, this is to them helpful. Mortal peril is to them helpful, is to them favorable. So we can understand from this that stupid things such as peace, safety, security, this is to them harmful. These are things, matters most dreaded. This is a scheme so villainous as though it were written with the pen of Shaitan himself. A fourth recommendation. We could develop a communist Cuban terror campaign in the Miami area, in other Florida cities, and even in Washington. The terror campaign could be pointed at Cuban refugees seeking haven in the United States. We could sink a boatload of Cubans en route to Florida, real or simulate. Develop a communist Cuban terror campaign. Develop is the word here meaning produce from scratch, produce from nothing. Facts, truths, guilt, innocence, all of this is meaningless. You can replace the variable words, communist Cuban, with any other group of people, and anyone can be made a terrorist. No one is safe. The only constant is the corporate class, imperial appetite to devour whatever their predatory eyes falls upon. And notice what they put into parentheses, real or simulated, not only are they plotting terrorism, but when speaking about killing innocent civilians or not, it's such a tertiary thought to them that they put it into parentheses, real or simulated, meaning we can really kill a boatload of Cubans or make it appear so. Life and death, the massacre of innocent people, they reduce to a parenthetical statement, like your choice between fries or coleslaw. What matters isn't if innocents live or die, what matters is can the pretext and by extension the further legitimization of terrorism be developed?
developed at the expense of these poor refugees, wandering people who've already fled their lands, traversed the oceans, arrived into the U.S. seeking their aid, seeking their shelter, only to have the U.S. slaughter them to rack up public rage points. They will plot and execute an act of terrorism only to legitimize their later and greater campaigns of terrorism, which their corporate class, their business corporate class, will call a war. The ideas for pretext in the memorandum are many, and we won't go through them all. But within the document, they also say that the need for this type of action, provocation, is now imminent since their efforts to stoke internal rebellion proved unsuccessful. So this indicates that this is one progressive stage of a seemingly multi-stage process of sabotage and overthrow. We couldn't get their own people to revolt against the ruler. So now let's manufacture provocations. Let's make up reasons that prove that we're the victims and they're the transgressors. And lastly, from the top secret document Operation Northwoods, U.S. fighter jets dressed and painted as Cuban fighter jets and then attacking other countries and leaving behind messages and letters that, quote, would be found proving Russian and or Cuban involvement. What's all this have to do with the Zionist state? It has everything to do with the Zionist state. In fact, business corporate America has more to do with the Zionist state than the Zionist state itself. But apart from the memorandum, there is another document, the diary of Moshe Sharet, the first foreign minister of the Zionist state and the second prime minister under David Ben-Gurion from 1948 to 1956 and 1954 to 1955 respectively. And why do we bother with a diary? Because Allah says in the Quran that hatred of you has already been made apparent from their mouths. وَمَا تُخْفِي صُدُورُهُمْ أَكْبَرُ but what their hearts conceal, what their hearts harbor, is far worse. And with a diary, you can have a glimpse into the hearts of men and peer into their insanity. And in Shared's diary, he mentions one particular incident, a time when his state, the Zionist state in Egypt, almost had peace. All peace talks were brought to him, Shared, from government officials and statesmen from all over from the U.S. Embassy official to Cairo, a U.S. State Department official, Roger Baldwin, who was the envoy of the U.S. League of Human Rights, who visited Cairo and told Sharet that Nasser of Egypt believes in coexistence and believes that the negotiations will prove fruitful. Sharet writes all this himself. All that, had to, all that remained to be done to forge a peace between the Zionist state and Egypt was for the Zionist state to sign the dotted line. And even their ambassador to the U.S., Abba Eben, sent the cable back to the Zionist state saying that the U.S. is ready to sign this agreement on the condition that we commit ourselves not to, ex to not extending our borders by force. And if we are attacked, the U.S. will commit itself to coming to our aid. But peace is a terrible, wretched thing only for wretched people. Charette quotes his landlady that day, writing, That is the end of peace and quiet. And ten days later, Ben-Gurion and the chief of staff Moshe Dayan, the head of the military, these two left together to meet with Charette. Charette, who's still a Zionist, still with the same aims as Ben-Gurion and all the others, except Charette favored diplomacy rather than the scorched earth approach. And about this meeting between the three of them, that resulted from all these peace talks. Sharet writes, Ben-Gurion arrived with the chief of staff who was carrying rolled up maps. I understood at once what would be the subject of the conversation. So don't talk to us about pestilent matters such as peace and coexistence. And if you talk to us too long about it, we'll massacre some of your civilians. Accidentally, Diane proposed a terror attack on Egypt on an army unit in order to provoke Egypt and rid themselves once and for all from any talks of peace, either from Egypt or from the U.S. Sharet writes, I approve the plan. I did approve 
a reprisal action. This term, reprisal actions, is one that Charette uses countless times throughout his diary. Reprisal actions are covert, undercover terrorist operations planned by the Zionist government with the aim of provoking a violent reaction from the target so that the target can be blamed, the Jews seem victimized, and thereby justifying greater acts of terrorism from the Zionist government. This was called their retaliation policy or their provoke and revenge doctrine. The number of Egyptian deaths that resulted from this reprisal action was 39 dead, 30 wounded, including a seven-year-old boy, but killing them was only half the goal. But blaming them for being killed and playing victim, that is their Machiavellian board. Now that the reprisal action is done, all that's left now is to recite the theater script, cry out to the world that it wasn't their fault, or it was an accident, or they were provoked. So what do they do? They hold a press conference. Charette writes, the army spokesman, on instructions from the Minister of Defense, notice these instructions, uh, these orders, are coming from administrators as high up as the Minister of Defense. Charette writes, the army spokesman, on instructions from the Minister of Defense, delivered a false version to the press. A unit of ours, after having been attacked supposedly inside our territory, returned the fire and engaged a battle which later developed as it did. He ends this diary entry from the 1st of March 1955 with the words, who will believe us? What was the false version that the army spokesman was instructed to give? That they were attacked and attacked within their territory. You see, these Zionist swine, they tell the exact opposite of reality, the exact opposite of the truth. The Charette writes, the embassy should be instructed to condemn Egypt and not be on the defensive. This is a tactic they use to this day. No matter how much or however you expose their crimes, they begin their hysterical and empty claims on someone else or something else, infantilizing the world of their crimes. Now, writes Charette, there will be a genuine impression that while we cry out over our isolation, the dangers to our security, we initiate aggression and reveal ourselves as being bloodthirsty and aspiring to perpetrate mass massacres. He's saying, how do we look to the world when we cry about our security while we perpetrate and initiate bloodbaths and mass massacres? You look like Zionists. This is a tactic they use to this day. Start the flame and pin the blame. Charette, in the very same day he gave these instructions to the embassies, realizes something later that day and now so embarrassed, he writes, when I wrote these things, these instructions to the embassies, that they should condemn Egypt and not be on the defensive, I still didn't know how crushing is the evidence that was already published refuting our official version. The huge amounts of arms and explosives, the tactics of the attack, the blocking and mining of the roads, the precise coordination of the attack, who would be foolish enough to believe that such a complicated operation could develop from a casual and sudden attack on a Zionist army unit by an Egyptian unit? Who would be foolish enough to believe? Who indeed? Livia Rokach, who was the daughter of Israel Rokach. Israel Rokach was a Zionist politician and the fourth mayor over Tel Aviv. His daughter Livia wrote her book based on the diaries of Moshe Charette, entitled Zionist Sacred Terrorism, published in 1980. She and her colleagues faced bitter backlash and threats from Zionist lobbies both within the U.S. and from abroad. The U.S. media maligned and berated her and her colleagues with all manner of labels. There were attempts to suppress the publication of her book, but Zionist politicians decided not to take legal action because they were afraid that it would bring the book much dreaded publicity. Here's some publicity. And in 1985, Livia Rokach was found dead in her hotel room. It was said to be suicide. Elsewhere in the diary, Charette commenting on all the Zionist initiated massacres in their region writes, all this must bring about revulsion in the sense of justice and honesty in public opinion. It must make the state appear in the eyes of the world as a savage state that does not recognize the principles of justice as they have been established and accepted by contemporary society. Yes, Premier, we do see you as savages.
and rejectors of justice. Even after Charette was ousted from his position for being too soft, for being too conscientious, the Zionist state continues with its inhumane tactics. To this day, look at when Zionist warplanes attacked the USS Liberty off the coast of Egypt. It did so with unmarked planes in an attempt to slaughter the entire crew on board, leave no survivors, and then pin the blame on Egypt. But some of the crewmen survived, and those of them still alive, or their families, seeking justice and closure on why their crew and their ship was slaughtered in an unprovoked attack. The Zionist state labels them neo-Nazis, anti-Semites, or conspiracy theorists. Or read about the Levon affair, when nine Zionist agents were caught bombing sites in Egypt and planning to pin the blame of those bombings on Egyptian terrorists. They were found out, many of them were hanged. The Zionist state denied any involvement until 50 or 60 years later, when their president, Moshe Katsev, yes, the one convicted of rape, celebrated them in a Jerusalem ceremony saying, although it is still a sensitive situation, we decided now to express our respect for these heroes. Terrorists, to them, are heroes. These nine agents, those of them still remaining, still alive, are wanting the entire details, the full details of their operation to be sung and praised in high school curricula within the Zionist state. Charette actually comments on the Live On Affair. When these nine Zionist agents were caught bombing Egyptian sites pretending to be Egyptian terrorists, Charette writes, People ask me if I am convinced that he gave the order. But let us assume that Gively has acted without instructions. Doesn't the moral responsibility lie all the same on Levon, who has constantly preached for acts of madness and taught the army leadership the, di the diabolical lesson of how to set the Middle East on fire, how to cause friction, cause bloody confrontations, sabotage targets and property of the powers, and perform acts of despair and suicide. And Charette, writing in his diary, he calls the deeds of his nation despair acts of diabolical acts of madness and acts of despair and suicide that are setting the Middle East on fire. This is what he said in private within his diary. But in public, he said the Egyptian court that tried and hanged these nine, uh, those nine Zionist bombers, he said the court, the Egyptian court, was motivated by blood libel and anti-Semitism exactly as they're doing today. Call the principles of justice throughout the world anti-Semitic, while in private they have meltdowns and a deranged panic over the world finding them out. But returning to the October 7th attacks, was it a surprise attack? Was it a failure of security? What does the record show? The Zionist government obtained a 40-page document belonging to Hamas. It was codenamed the Jericho Wall by Netanyahu's government. This document lays bare, point by point, the attack that Hamas planned to execute. Netanyahu's government was in possession of this document for one entire year before the October 7th attacks. But those at the top kept waving it away. Top officials even referred to it as imaginary. To them it meant nothing. Then finally, just three months before the attacks, they find that Hamas had conducted an intense day-long training exercise that appeared similar to the Jericho Wall bl blueprint. One veteran analyst with Unit 8200 from the Zionist State Signals Intelligence Agency, she seems to have had enough of her government's lack of concern. She gets into a back and forth email exchanges with the colonel over the Gaza division. This colonel applauds her for her concern, appreciates her diligence, but says that such plots are, quote, totally imaginative. This analyst, growing impatient in an email, writes, I utterly refute that the scenario is imaginary because the Hamas training exercise, she said, fully matched, quote, the content of Jericho Wall. It is a plan designed to start a war, she said. It's not just a raid on a village. Think about this for a moment. They knew the attacks. They had the document. Everything is written in black and white. They knew where the drills were being held. 
They knew the scale of devastation that the attack would cause. What they cry about is security. All these top officials had to do was press one button or place one call to send a team to raid and investigate. They already raid everything else. They could have sent the team to go and investigate and el eliminate and neutralize these serious security risks. But they didn't. They did nothing. Compare that to this. <laughs> What Zionist Jews did to a, pa a poor Palestinian woman, Yasmin Qadura, and how they converged upon her home with, in armored vehicles, with armored personnel, with, bearing military-grade weapons, came upon her home and charged her on the spot with supporting or sympathizing with terrorism only because her WhatsApp status read, May Allah grant them victory. So the WhatsApp status of a Palestinian woman that's a legitimate security risk. Militants conducting operation drills leaked documents of a known terror terrorist group mapping an attack. Totally imaginative. Sympathizers of terrorists are apprehended, but the terrorists themselves, they're not to be touched. This is because Hamas is a torch with a protected flame, safeguarded by the Zionist state itself, used to sear and scorch Palestine and Palestinians to a cinder. Surprise attack, caught by surprise, real or simulated. Yoram Iritz, a former commander of the Kerem Shalom section, commanded the Kisuv sector. This is someone who knows intimately the grounds of Gaza and the Gaza fence. He says the obstacle, meaning the wall, is built so that even a fox cannot pass it. But a bulldozer somehow they want us to believe got through. Commander Iritz gives further details on the degrees of security of that fence. He says, alerts on the fence are set according to three levels of pressure. If the fence is cut or sabotaged, the battalion is alerted at once and, uh, and the alarm raised. Forces are expected to converge at the point of disturbance on the fence within minutes, quote, if not seconds. The wall even has sensors that detect if anything is being dug underground around the fence. Each division has a standby squad for emergencies. Observers and observatories cover every inch. They detect movement even, even before it reaches the fence. Snipers and tanks with, quote, terrifying firepower cover obscure areas and blind spots. He says there are regular pre-dawn drills called dawn alert. All forces are awake and at the ready at this time. And we're told this is when the attacks had occurred. The commander said there are still more sophisticated levels of security he won't address, but lamented. Not a finger was lifted, not a single round fired in, re in alarm or defense. Three brigades, nine battalions, 36 companies, thousands of soldiers, all did nothing. Operation Northwoods. We could develop a terror campaign, land friendly Cubans in uniform over the fence to stage attack on base. Start the flame and pin the blame. The numbers data of the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, or TAZE, prove quantitatively that not only was there foreknowledge of the attacks, but inside knowledge of what was to come. Former Commissioner of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, Robert J. Jackson, an esteemed scholar of law from Columbia Law School, Joshua Mitz, conducted a study and found the following. We document a significant spike in short selling in the principal Zionist company ETF days before the October 7th Hamas attacks. The short selling that day far exceeded the short selling that occurred during numerous other periods of crisis, including the recession following the financial crisis, the 2014 Zionist Gaza war, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Similarly, we identify increases in short selling before the attack in dozens of Zionist companies traded in Tel Aviv. For one Zionist company alone, 4.43 million new shares sold short over the September 14th to October 5th period yielded profits or approximately avoided losses of millions on that additional short selling for one out of hundreds of securities traded on the Taze or the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. 
Our findings suggest that traders informed about the coming attacks profited from these tragic events and consistent with prior literature, we show that trading of this kind occurs in gaps in, the, in U.S. and international enforcement of legal prohibitions on informed trading. If you can imagine, these are all Zionist companies who are told by their government that an attack is coming on our people. So cut your losses. Salvage whatever millions and millions and millions of dollars that you can. What was on their minds is how do I save my dollars and cents? The blood of human beings, of my own people, let that be spilled. Otherwise, how can you explain how so many countless of how many countless Zionist companies all short sold their stocks within the same time frame in such a rapid rate? But I'm sure it's just a coincidence. It's not like those who deal in usury could live with themselves if they knew their wealth came from ill-gotten means. Surprise attack. Surprise is the operative word. This is the word deployed to program, to alter perceived reality. If there was any doubt left at all, Charette writes in his diary, I have been meditating on the long chain of false incidents and hostilities we have invented, and on the many clashes we have provoked, which cost us so much blood, and on the violations of the law by our men all of which brought grave disasters and determined the whole course of events and contributed to the security crisis. What contributed to their security crisis? The long chain of false incidents and hostilities we have invented. Self-defense. The only self-defense they're entitled to is before Nuremberg Tribunal. The coming of the attack was as much as a surprise as the coming of Friday after Thursday. Netanyahu said during one of his three fraud trials that anyone who wants to thwart the establishment of a Palestinian state has to support bolstering Hamas and transferring money to Hamas. This is part of our strategy. The Zionists hate this quote, so we're using it here. Even if they wish to deny this quote, it's been admitted by U.S. intelligence officials that the Zionist government has funded Hamas for decades. Palestine lies beside Egypt, meeting at the Rafah border, when the seedlings of the Muslim Brotherhood from the 1920s scattered into Palestine. They were nourished and cultivated by the Zionist government into the terror group now known as Hamas, before, long before it was called Hamas. The United Press International reports, according to several current and former U.S. intelligence officials, Beginning in the late 1970s, Tel Aviv gave direct and indirect financial aid to Hamas over a period of years. This is part of our strategy, Netanyahu says. What strategy is that? Bolstering and empowering a terrorist organization. It is this reason Hamas was promoted by the Zionist government from terror group to legitimate organization, whereupon millions were funneled to them from neighboring countries. How you care and cradle your child is how the Zionist state cares for Hamas. It would ensure that it is strengthened, that it is able to stand on its own and, to, and see to its success. Just as you nurture your child and see to its success, they say that Palestinians are guilty because they voted for Hamas once. This doesn't even amount to the height of a fingernail compared to the resolute and ceaseless support that the Zionist government has given to Hamas for half a century now. Why else would one financially, militarily, and politically support a terrorist organization if you don't plan to cause great casualties within your own nation and within Palestine? You're an occupation, actually. I shouldn't even refer to you as a nation. Carnage, pestilence, demolished infrastructure. Gaza is haunted by every aesthetic of terror. It's no surprise, then, that the surprise attacks were no surprise at all. They knew full well and allowed the attacks if they didn't commit it themselves. Why? Because they're finally about to get their, their money's worth. Plans halted for years can finally proceed and be realized. Their diabolical plan of conjuring pretexts, it reeks of North Woods. Surprise attack, right to defend itself. They choose the wording of their headlines carefully. Their military crimes, 
are premeditated, deliberated, coordinated, and the wordings of their headlines just the same. It's truly an art of rigging and manipulation. When you read the words right to defend itself, it's the words right and defend at play here. Right indicates there is a freedom under siege. Liberty itself is being threatened. To deny them this right, to say anything to the contrary, is an act of tyranny. Defend, it extinctively conjures the image of a victim, a hapless, wrongfully oppressed plaintiff. Defend, conjures the image of the good guy, like a child, a poor child being bullied at school. This word defend also lets the readers know that the unprovoked attacker deserves whatever it has coming. All pity and understanding is instantly rendered obsolete. They rig the charges of their bombs and detonators just like they rig the language of their headlines in the media. Masterfully done. One must know the language of these hissing nests of snakes and raise a lantern to their crimes. And we don't mention any of this because we believe this will appeal to their better nature or probe some investigation. No. But we do this for the preservation of our aqidah under the guiding ayah لِتَسْتَبِينَ سَبِيلُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ so that the ways of the criminals may become known. And on the 26th of May, 1955, Diane also wanted to make the creed and the spirit of the Zionist state known. These harrowing words, Diane, he speaks during a meeting with the most prestigious members of the Zionist government. He tells all those attending the lasting ideology of the Zionist state. Diane says, reprisal actions which we couldn't carry out if we were tied to a security pact are our vital lymph. They make it possible for us to maintain a high level of tension among our population and in the army. Without these actions, we would have ceased to be a combative people. And without the discipline of a combative people, we are lost. We have to cry out that the Negev is in danger so that young men will go there. He's saying we cannot ever be without terrorism. It is needed in order to maintain the danger or the facade of danger, the illusion of an existential threat to state security. Not to be a combative people, says Diane, is tragedy and means the end of the state. This is why they cherish reprisal actions. This is why they cherish terrorism. This is why they cry out that the Negev is in danger. The Negev is a desert. What is it in danger of? Being watered, rained upon, irrigated, no, reprisal actions are their life's vital force, which out, without which, says Diane, the state dies. It can only exist in an atmosphere of terror, in an atmosphere of chaos. This is the same Diane who, when he died in 1981, the New York Times called him the architect of peace. They have no claim to self-defense. They have no claim to innocence. They have no claim to any goodness in the world. This is only their propaganda, and just as their armies seek to imperialize free lands, such as their propaganda that seeks to imperialize free media, free journalism. These are people who grimace at the mere mention of peace. These are people who don't value life to begin with. And how terrible! In the land of olive trees, they refuse the olive branch. They refuse the olive branch because they want the lands of our olive trees. Their gruesome schemes. Their stiff-necked arrogance throughout the world is captured all in one ayah. Istikbaran fil ardi wa makra sayy wa la yuhiqu al makra sayy illa bi ahli. Arrogance throughout the land and plotting evil. And the evil plots will encompass only those who hatch them. Their plots and their schemes will be their own undoing. But what we worry about is what the Muslims will say and what the Muslims will do. Much hangs in the balance. The entire world can be saved from the savagery that engulfs it today. But for the Muslims, how can we escape these endless horrors that appear one after another in succession like the gems on a necklace? A condition so weak and pathetic throughout the world. We can't even ward off the attacks of jackals when they gnaw at us. We shouldn't have to beg others to make up their minds not to massacre us or wait on some international league to determine whether or not enough of our children, women, and elderly have been systematically butchered. And there is a way. There is a way instead of asking for ceasefires, 
The need for ceasefires never even arises. There is a way instead of crying to be seen as human by them. The need to rouse their humanity never even arises. And what way is that? It is a way, it is an escape from all of our exhausting woes in dunya and akhirah. It is leaving the wasteland of subjugation and into the corridors of power. Allah says in the Quran, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمُلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لِيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَلَا يُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمُ الَّذِي ارْتَضَى لَهُمْ وَلَا يُبَدِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنًا يَعْبُدُونَنِي لَا يُشْرِكُونَ بِي شَيْئًا Allah says in this magnificently hopeful ayah that He will grant the believers power and rulership throughout the lands, that He will establish and empower their deen, and that He will change their fears into safety and security on the condition provided that they worship Him alone and don't associate anything with Him upon untainted, pure tawheed. But it can't be this simple. Allah will grant us power, dominion, and safety just by worshiping Him alone. All of our troubles throughout the world gone just by Tawheed. Allah, the creator of mankind, the creator of these creatures that doubt and second guess, He knows that this ayah some will find surprising or perplexing. But if we cast a second glance at the ayah, we notice we find subtleties. Allah's choice of words, His choice of letters that convey a promise like no other. This is an ayah like no other. Allah says, Allah has, Allah has promised, past tense, meaning it is a matter already sorted and settled. And does Allah need to promise? Is there anyone more truthful than Allah? No. Still, He promises as, a, as emphasis and reassurance of what's to come. He's promised those amongst us who believe and work righteously. Believe meaning the correct sound belief, sound aqidah. And work righteously meaning those that, are, that have been conveyed to us and in accordance and compliance with the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu That he will make them rulers. But Allah doesn't just say, يَسْتَخْلِفُهُمْ That he will make them rulers. Allah said, لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ and these two extra letters flanked on both ends of the word are why this ayah is so unique. This letter is Lam al Qasim, the Lam of swearing an oath, the Lam of the oath. And it returns back to Allah's initial promise. So it means Allah here swears by His own glory and name. Though Allah speaks true, He has also promised. Though He has promised, He now also swears upon Himself. And this added letter, Nun at Tawqeed, is a letter for added emphasis and reassurance. Allah has laced this word with promise, emphasis, and reassurance, meaning that Allah will most assuredly make us rulers throughout the lands, just as He has conferred power to those before us, and that He will establish and empower our deen. This word is also flanked on both ends with the same letters, Lam at Tawqeed and Nun at Tawqeed. As if it wasn't enough, Allah is still reassuring you of this reality, this promise of His. And when Allah speaks about changing our condition, and it will be Allah that does so, not us, not by our own devices. He laces these words with the same letters, Lam at Tawqeed as the opening, and Noon at Tawqeed as the seal. Layers upon layers of reassurance from our Lord that this will come to pass. Our fear and our grief, and, and fear of what? The fear of having our homes bombed, our houses stormed in night raids by occupying invaders. The fear of kissing our family members farewell in the morning and then kissing their corpses farewell in the evening. The fear of abduction, persecution, the, f the fear of being entrapped and framed, the fear of reprisal actions, and the fear of pretext. All of these Allah will replace with safety and security. Notice how the grammatical mode in the speech of Allah changes from the third person to the first. Throughout the promises, Allah says that Allah has promised and that He will grant them rulership. And, that, and throughout the promise, it is He will and He will. But coming to the condition, Allah changes His address to the first person. That they worship Me alone and don't associate anything with Me. 
In Arabic, in Balagha, this is a rhetorical device called al-iltifat. It is when the expected syntactic construction of speech is absent, and this is employed to draw your attention and bring you to heed the matter at hand. As as Shaykh Ibn al-Uthaymeen rahimahullah mentions, the various instances Allah uses this manner of speech in the Qur'an, going from the absent form, al-ghaybah, to the present form, al-hudur. Al-iltifat has many purposes, and one such purpose is al-ihtimam, Allah bringing your attention to a matter most grand and grave by speaking of it in the first person himself, so that you understand that rulership and power and safety hinges on this condition. So understand the importance of Tawheed. Another purpose is a dalala to al ikhtisas exclusivity. Transitioning from the third person narrative to the first to convey the meaning that divine and absolute power over the matter in question is his authority alone. So if our Tawheed is not correct, then work your way backwards through the ayah, we will not have safety and security, but we will linger in perpetual fear and instability. We will not have our deen established and powerful. And we will not be rulers, but we will be subjects tossed here and about. So if anyone at any time who doesn't grant importance to aqidah comes and tells you that there's some other solution to the ummah that they've suddenly found, keep this ayah before your eyes. And remember always how Allah changes the very modality of His speech to make you aware of how grave and how true is His promise and His condition and what it means to us. The condition of this great momentous promise is that we worship Allah alone and we don't associate anything with Him. This ayah, there is no other ayah with this many counted assurances, with this many levels and layers of reassurance and emphasis because it is Allah alone who can truly say what reality is, what it will be and what He will make it. The condition to have this promise fulfilled is that we single Allah in all that are His rights, in His Lordship, in His worship and in His names and attributes and that we don't allocate or apportion His rights, not a single one of His rights to anyone or anything else. And it is Tawheed that is at the head of all goodness that we can ever hope to attain. In the Tawheed of Allah, we will have our security in dunya and akhirah. Allah says in the Quran, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِمَانُهُمْ بِظُلْمُ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمَنُ وَهُمْ مُحْتَدُونَ Those who believed and do not cloak or garb their iman with oppression, meaning shirk as the Prophet ﷺ has explained, it is they who will have safety and security and it is they who are rightly guided. When iman is mentioned in the general sense, in this manner, then it entails all that Allah and His Messenger وسلم, have commanded. As Shaykh Ibn Baz mentions or comments regarding this ayah saying that Iman here, it is referring to Al-Istiqamah, being upright upon the correct Tawheed and that we don't ascribe anything to Allah, that we grant Him His rights and we stay away from all that He has prohibited. When Allah mentions prosperity, peace, Safety and security, he mentions Iman, belief in Tawheed. Elsewhere in the Quran, Allah says, وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلَ الْقُرَىٰ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْ لَفَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَرَكَاتٍ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَكِنْ كَذَّبُوا فَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ If the people of these regions and societies only had Iman and Taqwa, we would have certainly opened for them the blessings from the heavens and the earth. But they belied our messengers, and so we seized them with a punishment for what they themselves had earned of shirk and other crimes. As Suyuti says regarding this ayah, that Allah's mention of iman and taqwa here, al iman is al ma'atufu alayh, it is joined by taqwa. So it is the joining of something broad, taqwa, to something specified, iman. And that is because taqwa is the broad observance of all that Allah has commanded. And specifically, the greatest of that is Iman. So this means that we should have taqwa, the greatest of what we should have taqwa with is our Iman, whereby we don't pollute it with shirk. This ayah, Allah says how a society can prosper and how a society can perish. So if Tawheed will unlock the blessings and goodness from the heavens and the earth, then shirk conversely 
will keep all our blessings vaulted, but unlock instead every affliction upon us. Ash-Shawkani, commenting on this ayah, says that Allah is saying that He will make easy for them, He will facilitate for them, He will stream to them the treasures and goodness and blessings from the heavens and the earth, just as a locked door is made easily accessible once it is unlocked and open. And what an unlocking. As Shaykh Al-Imam As-Sa'di Rahimahullah commenting on this ayah says, Allah will make the lives of the believers fruitful and flourishing, their rizq opulent, whereby they will not suffer, they will not fatigue for it, they will have it without toil or afflictions. Allah will grant us all the things that we are deprived of today in Palestine and in other Muslim nations because Tawheed is the right of Allah Azza wa Jal. And if we refuse to give Allah His right, then with what sanity can we rightfully claim ours from Him? And with what right can we expect a goodly living if we com a compromise our Tawheed? And what protection can we expect from Allah if we with our own hands destroy the foundations upon which the promise of Allah rests. And historically, whenever the Muslims were losing grounds to the Kuffar or under their siege, the Imams of the Salaf would exert greater effort into writing, holding sermons, and producing more works focusing on Aqeedah and specifically the Tawheed of Allah just like the Imams are doing today, so that the Muslims may awaken from their slumber and bring stability after what was once a horrifying imbalance. Because if the Muslims will not correct it, the world will suffer. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, speaking on the weakness or the power that the Muslims possess, said, To the extent that the Muslims depart from the Tawheed of their Lord, their honor, their glory, and their power will depart from them also. Relinquish the importance of Aqeedah, you relinquish your power. You relinquish your power, you are vanquished within the hour. So if we the Muslims who profess to believe in Allah and His Messenger وسلم, also believe in zodiac signs or good luck charms such as the blue eye and other talismans. If we swear by other than Allah, if we invoke the dead for help or aid, if we alter or outright deny the names and attributes of Allah which He Himself makes Himself known by, if we place our hopes, reliance and trust in others before Allah if we hold what the disbelievers have to be greater than what we possess of Islam, if we put the opinions and erroneous philosophies of others above the Prophet Sallallahu and his Sunnah, then Allah's champion aid, our restoration of power and izzah will never be forthcoming. Of course, we should know the art of statecraft, global economics, resource leveraging, international trade and commerce, geopolitical dynamics, but the foundation, the heart of the Ummah's glory and power and its safety is in the Tawheed of our Lord, Jalla wa'ala. And before this final word, please find the links below to donate to Palestine. All proceeds will go to the displaced. Nothing will be kept for ourselves. Sharet once asked Ben Gurion, what will the world say about all this we're doing? from reprisal actions on downward. Ben Gurion replied, it doesn't matter what the Goyim will say, what the Gentiles, what the non-Jews will say. What matters only is what the Jews will do. And the Muslims today have a greater question to answer. What has Allah said? And thus, what will the Muslims then do? These whom we've mentioned, these architects of chaos, they desire reality to be of their making, a reality wherein they are legitimate and their propaganda and lies are trusted. They wish to be trusted and so seek your trust. But when Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, has already asked us for our trust, we won't place our trust in our enemies who care nothing for us. We will place our trust in our Lord and His promise and trust in what He says he will make reality into, if we so decide. And why should we not put our trust in Allah, who has indeed guided us our ways, and we shall certainly bear with patience all that you cause us to suffer. And let those who trust put their trust in Allah alone. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant.
أستغفرك وأتوب إليك